Hello and welcome to another episode in the Godot Basics tutorial series. In this episode, we will be talking about the LiskOf substitution. So what exactly is the LiskOf substitution principle? Well, the general statement for this principle is the following. Let a group of X be a property provable about objects X of type T. Then group of Y should be true for objects y of type s where type s is a subtype of type t and functions that use pointers or references to base classes must be able to use objects of derived classes without knowing it now what exactly does that mean? Well, I went ahead and created a diagram for you. So again, we have our group X and it's basically made up of objects that have the class T and our class T is a parent of class S and class S is part of a group of Y. Now, this is just the diagram to explain how the code interacts with each other. The only thing that's of importance is that we have a parent class and we have a child class. So the substitution principle can be shown in this graph here and why the substitution principle is important. So in our case, we have a program. Imagine just an application and our entire application relies on an object that comes from the class T and class T is our base class. Now, if we were to switch what our program uses, in this case, if program P uses class S, notice how our program still works, uh, or rather, our program P should continue to work. In this case, look, our program is green, which means it's working when we are using an object of class T, and our program is also working when it now relies on an object of class S instead of class T. And what the sentence of the substitution principle was telling you is that if a subclass inherits from the base class, and some type of function class or program uses the subclass, it should work with the base class as well and vice versa. Now, how exactly do we implement the substitution principle? Well, it's really simple. Just make sure that your child class's functions are 100% compatible with its parents class. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So we have an enemy class and it has a function get health. And the most important part about this is that it returns an integer value. So in this case, our program P could be anything really, but it uses get health and it does math calculations. So in this case, whatever our program P is, it relies on the enemies class get health function and whatever program P is, it's expecting an integer when it calls get health. So we also have a shield enemy class that inherits from the base enemy class. And Notice how we don't do anything here. So our shield enemy class doesn't break Liskov's substitution. However, let's take a look at our sword enemy class. Our sword enemy class decided to override the function get health and we return a string. Now that's how you break the substitution principle. So why is it wrong? Well, if we have a program P and instead of having program P point to the enemy class calling its get health expecting an integer to be returned back, if program P now points to the sword enemy class and calls its get health function, it's going to receive a string, but our program P is using and doing math calculations. And so your program P will throw an error. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, why doesn't program P just have if statements and if guards to see if we're getting a string and then do something different? And that breaks the substitution principle because our program now knows about the classes. So the solution's simple, just don't return different results. So look at our sword enemy class again. We have a get health, and instead of returning a string, we now return an integer. And that's it. Now let's say you really, really need a string. For some reason, not only does program P need to get health, but some other class, program P.2, for example, needs to also get a string value of your health. So what you do is instead of overriding the base classes return data type what you instead do is you create a new function and then you can go ahead and use that function to return your intended data type in this case we want to return a string and then our program p.2 can rely on the string value of your health 
And at the same time, program P can call the enemy class, get the get health function expecting an integer. And if we have program P point to the sword enemy class, when program P calls the get health function, it will in fact get an integer. And there you have it, voila. So the benefits of Liskov principle is it's less error prone when using subclasses of a parent class, especially since GDScript uses something called duct typing, which was talked briefly about in the GDScript fundamental tutorial series. Now, there is also another benefit to the substitution principle, and that is when we are growing our classes as time goes by on our project, we sometimes forget what we are doing and so it is best not to override base class functions for example we may have more than one class inheriting from the enemy class in this example we only have one but what if we have 10 enemy class children and one of them decides to override the function and return a different value well when we do duct typing when we pass a class through a function and call the get health we may possibly throw an error or create a bug an unexpected result because sometimes we build our functions expecting one result in this case the integer but our class throws us in a loop and decides to return a different value so it's always good practice that when you override a base classes function to not change the return data type if you need a different data type you go ahead and create a separate function now you can override functions but you should override the logic inside the function rather than the data type your function is returning it will make your life easier as a programmer let's go ahead and take a look at some code so i have three classes here a bad enemy file a bad shield enemy file and a bad manager file in the bad enemy file we have a class name called bad enemy and we have a single function called get health we've added a parameter and we've given it the default value of the literal integer value 100 and notice that there's no semicolon which means that this get health does not have a data type inferred from the assignment operator the assignment operator being the equal sign moving on we also have the return keyword and we're returning back our parameter with the default value 100 now i want you to keep two things in mind one, we have a parameter, it's expecting, or at least it has the intended expectation of receiving a literal integer value inside the parameter. And second of all, we are expecting to return back an integer value to whoever is calling our get health function. Now we're going to go ahead and take a look at the enemy class that inherits from the bad enemy to see how we break the substitution principle. So here you can see in our bad shield class we are extending from the bad enemy class. And of course we've given this the class name called bad shield. So one thing that I did not mention in the slides is that the Liskov substitution principle states that not only should you not change your outputs, you should not change your inputs as well. So in the bad enemy class, we have a health equals 100. We are expecting a literal integer value in our parameter. However, in our bad shield enemy class called bad shield, notice how our parameter is defaulting to a string, meaning we are expecting a string value to be passed into the parameter. So this is how we break Lipskov substitution with the inputs. And because our default value is a string value, when we return our value, we are returning back a literal string value, or rather a variable that holds a string value. And that's how we break off Lipskov substitution for the outputs. Now in our bad manager class, no name for this class, we are importing or rather injecting our classes. So we're injecting our bad enemy class and our bad shield class. I have a health variable, also called a property, and we've just declared it. We haven't really assigned it anything. And that's because one, we want to be able to accept both the integer and the string. 
Now in our ready function, notice how we're using the damage health method. And if we take a look at our damage health method down here, you can see we are expecting an enemy health and it has to have the data type integer. And we have a simple math calculation. We're just subtracting 10 from the value being passed down and we're returning it back. So on our first call of the local damage health method, we're calling the base class and we're passing it the get health function basically we're passing the literal integer value 100. And so we should get back 90. Our health variable should be 90. Now, when we get to the second line, we are using the bad shield class and we're using the bad shields method called get health. And remember that we are returning back a string. And so in our function, what you will notice when this code runs is that it will throw an error. Now it throws an error because one, our parameter is expecting the integer data type. However, we are passing a string value. So we don't even get inside. The error is thrown just by calling our method damage health and passing it the string value. Now this is a basic rudimentary and simple example of how we are breaking Liskov substitution. And the real issue is as the code base grows, you do not want to change function return types and or parameters because our code that relies on it is probably expecting it just like our damage help. So let's go ahead and take a look at how to solve this. So we have three files again, but this time they're called good because this is the good example, the example that does not break the substitution principle. So three files, good enemy, good manager, good shield enemy. In our good enemy class, it's very similar to the bad enemy class. However, we added some safety checks, or rather we made our intentions clear by describing what we want and how we want it. So in this case, we have the get health function. Nothing's changed in the naming convention. However, notice how we're inferring a data type. In the last example, we broke Lipskov substitution because the class that inherited from the enemy class changed the input. In this case, it, it took in a string instead of taking in an integer. And we solve this by doing data type inference. So with the colon equal symbol, not only are we assigning a default value to our parameter, but we are also inferring the integer data type. Now this is good because when you infer a data type and you inherit from a class who has a function that infers a data type in its parameters, the children class cannot edit the data types that the parent class has inferred. So that's sort of our first step into defensive programming. So that means that our children class cannot mess up the data type we're expecting inside our parameter. Now we do have the arrow symbol with the int data type, or rather the integer data type. What we are saying is that we want our function to return an int. And so when we return our value, we are returning an integer value, in this case 100, if we don't pass anything inside the parameter. I want to show you the good shield enemy class, and we are extending from the good enemy class, and we've given it the class name good shield. I went ahead and I created a constant. It's a data type integer, and we've assigned the value 20. And I went ahead and created the get health function. And notice how we have to write out the same thing. In this case, we have a parameter and it's inferred a value data type. In this case, one, our default value will be 20 and two, because we're inferring, we are inferring an integer. If we were to change the value of our default value, we will in fact throw an error because we are inheriting from a class that has already defined the inferred data type of the parameter inside the function. So that's our defensive programming at work. Now we've also stated that we require our function to return an integer. And so we do not break Lipskov's substitution, even though we are creating a different default value. In this case, our default value is 20 versus the base class, the parent class, which is the default value 100. We are still passing an integer into our parameters. So we don't care so much being exactly the same as our parent class. We can change the default value, but we should not change the parameter 
or rather the parameters expected data type. So that's the first thing, don't change inputs. Second, we return the health variable. In this case, it's going to be an integer 20 if we don't pass anything to the parameter. And that's how we don't break Lipskov's principle when returning a value, as in Lipskov's principle expects us not to change the output. However, we can do different things. We don't have to exactly be the same as our good enemy class, which returns the actual variable health. We could, in fact, just return a literal value. We could even return back a string and cast it as an integer. It doesn't matter what we do inside, all the Liskov principle cares about is that one, our input should be the same as our base class we are inheriting from, and two, our output value should be the same as our base class. In both cases, they are integers. Now, let's say it's important that you do in fact have, or rather change your integer into a string. Well, you go ahead, you create that function. And in this case, we have our constant value because by default, we expect it to be 20 and we cast it as a string. Now, this is a very basic example. Probably want to add a little more functionality to make sure that whatever our, or rather to make sure that our player who uses the get health, whatever is assigned into it in the parameter also gets returned back as a string value in our get health, but that's out of scope. The important thing is that if you need something, don't change the function that you're inheriting from your base class, rather create a new function. It's gonna help you out. And to top it all off, we have a manager class and we're importing both our good enemy class and our good shield class. And they went ahead and created a variable property called health. And this time when we call our damage health, both calls from the good enemy class dot get health function and the good shield class dot get health function will in fact not throw an error. The code will be a success. We will both get the value back 90 when we run each line in the ready virtual function. And that's basically it. So to summarize, one, when you're inheriting from a base class, you do not want to change the input of your parameter. And two, you do not want to change your output of the value. That's all I have for you in this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you learned a lot. If you have any questions or need anything clarified, please feel free to leave a comment down below in the comment section. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Have an amazing day.